Hi, everyone. Welcome to the big debate. I'm David Chalmers, uh, co-director of the Center for Mind, Brain, and Consciousness, along with my colleague, Ned Block. Uh, the Center for Mind, Brain, and Consciousness is an interdisciplinary center here at NYU devoted to exploring foundational issues in the mind-brain sciences, and we organize uh, a lot of activities, among which are a bunch of, uh, of public activities, a series of, um, we've been organizing a series of annual conferences every year. I think a bunch of you were at the conference last year on the ethics of artificial intelligence. Uh, coming up in November this year, November 17th and 18th, we have a conference on animal consciousness with a bunch of really interesting people involved. Um, you're all encouraged to come along to that one. But we also organize a series of debates, one every semester on foundational issues. Uh, debates we've had recently include ones over mirror neurons, unconscious perception, moral psychology, art and neuroscience, innate concepts, cognition perception, many, uh, many others. And the, and the thought is to bring a foundational controversial issue into sharp relief by having proponents of two different sides um, on that issue uh, present their point of view. So the debate today, I think, will be our first one devoted specifically to issues in artificial intelligence, which is, of course, one of the mind-brain sciences broadly construed. Artificial minds are minds, too. Um, but the, uh, the debate here really, in some ways, grows out of and parallels a very familiar debate in psychology and the sciences of the human mind, the debate between nativists and empiricists about the, the human mind, broadly speaking, a nature-nurture debate over what is more important, uh, learning from the environment or a certain kind of innate endowment of innate mechanisms built in at birth. Now, this is a debate that goes back for centuries and indeed millennia. Um, in the history of philosophy, for example, you know, Plato was a great nativist who held that we had all kinds of knowledge built in to us at birth. Uh, there are many empiricists in the history of philosophy, too. John Locke and David Hume, the British empiricists who held that you know, basically you start from a blank slate, a uh, tabula rasa, and go on to acquire, to learn empirical associations from the environment from which all of our knowledge and all of our cognition develops. And this debate, which started from philosophy, turned into a debate in psychology for many years, where there are empiricists, such as the behaviorists, the associationists, more recently, some connectionists and some Bayesians put all the emphasis, put a whole lot of the emphasis onto learning from the environment. And at the same time, there are nativists, such, you know, most famously, probably Chomsky, but then uh, more recently, people like uh, Fodor and Pinker, and indeed many people within devel developmental psychology, where nativist approaches um, stressing the need for innate de domain specific mechanisms have been extremely popular. So what started as a debate in philosophy turns into a debate in psychology. And now what we're, we're seeing is this is to some extent turning into a debate in artificial intelligence as well. Um, so the current debate is about AI systems. And it's very much triggered by looking at the recent prominence of machine learning um, in AI, and in particular, the, uh, the explosion of work in deep learning, where the emphasis is very much on starting from relatively simple systems and learning from the environment. And the question is really, how far can learning mechanisms, in particular, but not only, deep learning get you? Um, you know, proponents of deep learning, of which uh, Jan LeCun is one very prominent uh, proponent, say that deep learning can get you very, very far. And if you want to get further, um, the best place to put the focus is on more and better learning mechanisms. Uh, critics 
of deep learning, of which uh, Gary Marcus is a prominent one, say deep learning will get you so far and maybe even some good way, but there are going to be some very serious principled limitations on where it will get you. And to get beyond there, we need to really put some serious focus on the right kind of innate machinery um, and on innate mechanisms, as in the debate over psychology. Um, you know, in the end, everyone concedes there's some very significant role for innate mechanisms and some very significant role for learning. And you know, who, who gets to win the debate often depends on who more successfully defines the terms you know, and, and su sufficiently puts the burden onto the others. So what degree of an innateness and what degree of, uh, of deep learning, of learning mechanisms actually counts? Um, in framing this debate, we went back and forth for you know, weeks on exactly what the correct topic should be for the debate, since everyone thinks there's got to be some innate machinery, everyone thinks deep learning will, will do a lot, everyone thinks it won't do everything. In the end, we said, does AI need more innate machinery? Which, of course, raises the question, more than what? Um, more than it has now, well, probably both. Gary will say most definitely yes, a whole lot more than it has now. Probably even Jan will say we can, we can use some more innate machinery. In the end, what we thought was that uh, really what the issue might come down to is, given the limitations on current AI systems, where should the focus be? What do we need most to move forward towards more advanced AI systems, towards human level artificial intelligence? I think both sides will agree. Yes, better learning mechanisms are important. Yes, more innate mechanisms are important, but which one of those things do we need more? Which is the most important in moving forward? Jan is gonna say better deep learning mechanisms. That's the most, uh, that's the most important thing. Gary's gonna say we need more innate machinery. So really the topic should be not does AI need more innate machinery, but does AI need more innate machinery more than it needs better deep learning mechanisms? <laughs> but that was really way too, uh, way too long for a, uh, for a poster, so we're going with the, uh, the shorter version instead. But we really have the perfect uh, debaters for this, uh, for this topic. Uh, Jan LeCun is, uh, is one of the pioneers of deep learning, done important work on neural networks since the, uh, the 1980s. Been here at uh, NYU for many years as professor of computer science, founder of the Center for Data Science, is now also director of AI research as Facebook, and been a very, very prominent advocate and developer of deep learning systems. Gary Marcus has for many years been a, uh, a critic, or at least a, a very a constructive critic of uh, certain kinds of neural network approaches to, uh, to cognition. His first book, The Algebraic Mind, was arguing that at the very least, uh, neural network-based approaches needed to be combined with certain kinds of symbol processing mechanisms in order to be maximally Productive um, has written a lot on, uh, from the perspective of psychology and linguistics, on the need for innate symbolic structure in cognition. And in his recent years, been a prominent voice criticizing, um, or at least you know, pointing to a need for going beyond current deep learning approaches if we really want to make progress, uh, deep progress in artificial intelligence. And Gary's professor of psychology and linguistics here at NYU also um, started up a machine learning company, Geometric Intelligence, which not too long ago he uh, sold to, uh, to Uber, and I think was very briefly heading up uh, AI at Uber before seeing the better of his ways and returning back to join us at, uh, at NYU, for which we're, we're very pleased. This is incidentally our first all NYU debate. It turns out just the, we look for the best people worldwide to take on the sides of this debate, but you know, the, the search just ended up in our Backyard, who better than Gary Marcus and Jan LeCun to, uh, to debate this topic? So the structure of this will be, uh, Gary will go first because he's arguing for the affirmative, AI needs more innate machinery and will speak for 25 minutes. Jan will respond for, Jan will speak for 25 minutes and we'll have eight minutes each um, in response and follow up to each other. Then we'll bring everybody up onto stage, a little bit more interaction and we'll take it to the audience for what I'm sure will be a lively discussion. But uh, for our first speaker, it's a great pleasure to welcome Gary Marcus.
Thank you, very, thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Is this a good uh, mic level? OK, so uh, David stole my, my title slide, so I can repurpose it uh, now. I'm Gary Marcus. Um, so I'm going to start actually with a quote from the head of uh, AI, essentially, at Microsoft, which captures something I've been arguing for a number of years pretty nicely. He says, computers today can perform, sp can perform specific tasks very well. But when it comes to general tasks, AI cannot compete with a human child. And the question is, why not? I want to, um, before going too much further, start with a news flash, which is Jan and I don't disagree about that much. Of course, I'm sure we will find some things to disagree about today. But on the weekend, I made a list of seven things that I thought we agreed about. And some of my friends said, do you really know that Jan agrees uh, with you on these things? And I thought by now, Jan and I have had a lot of discussions, and I had a pretty good theory of his mind. So I emailed him, and he wrote back, half an hour later or something like that and said, not only do I agree with these seven points, um, but they've actually been the essence of what I've been talking about for the last three years. So we agree that AI is still in its infancy. We agree that machine learning is fundamentally necessary for reaching strong AI. We agree that deep learning is a powerful technique for, uh, for machine learning. We agree that deep learning is not by itself enough for cognition. We agree that something called model-free reinforcement learning, which is popular deep mind, is not the answer either. We would also agree that AI needs better internal forward models. And since I don't have enough time to describe everything, I'll leave it to Jan to teach you what that is. Um, and I think we fundamentally agree that common sense reasoning remains fundamentally unsolved. And that's one of the most important questions facing AI today. What I'm going to suggest today is that human grade intelligence is too complex to be manually hardwired. I think probably everybody here will agree with that. Um, but I'll also argue that current machine learning systems come too close to being blank slates. And so it very much is an echo of the nativism and empiricism debate. I'm going to suggest that AI largely tends towards the empiricist side of the spectrum, and that that's a problem, and it hasn't served AI particularly well. And as a result, what, what people have come up with are kind of sterile machines that are tied brittily to enormous data sets, much vaster than children might need, and that they have little ability to transfer their knowledge to new problems. And I'll give you an illustration of that later. So you might say that they're strong on narrow AI, the techniques that we have right now, but they're non-starters on strong AI. There's been very little progress on general purpose AI where you could just sort of point the box at whatever problem you have without having humans massage the data and so forth and just expect a reasonable answer from the machine. Um, Jan, I think, is going to take the empiricist view. We'll see whether we actually disagree. Um, but at least in the media, he takes the empiricist view. So in, in this technology review report, he's attributed the idea that you can just have AI that learns just by observing the world. And that very much echoes what John Locke said. I think John Locke is a kind of paradigmatic empiricist. He said, all ideas come from sensation or reflection. And I'll, I'll just skip a little bit. But I mean, he says, basically, we have a blank slate. And where does everything come from? In one word, experience. I think Jan has sort of modern tools. I put in an old version of the slide. I apologize. But um, has modern tools. Uh, for doing this. So where John Locke just had an abstract idea that maybe you could learn everything from experience, Jan has built tools that actually try to uh, test that conjecture. And in many cases, get pretty far. I'll argue far, not far enough, but they certainly make a lot of progress. The tradition that I'm in, I would uh, attribute to Plato, first of all, um, his, his famous uh, slave boy di dialogue, to Kant, who, as I would psychologize him, argued in the critique of pure reason that we had to have an innate notion of time and space. That's not his words. Um, I read the translation, and I'm told even German scholars read the translation because it's so hard to parse. But that is how I take um, Kant. Of course, Noam Chomsky is famous for arguing there's a language acquisition device. And I think I actually come a little bit closer to Liz Spelke's view, um, where she talks about a core of innate primitives that allow us to know about things like sets and objects and places and so forth. Um, I've been arguing in different form for, for nativist views. So um, in the book, The Algebraic Mind, I focused on representations and primitives. Um, you could think of the brain as something like a microprocessor. And I said, these are the things that that microprocessor must have. I'll come back to this a little bit later. In the book, The Birth of the Mind, I talked about nativism from a biological perspective and basically asked, is nativism compatible with biology? And where, where might you get your innate structure from? The key claims that I will make today is, first of all, I would concede, I don't think any reasonable person wouldn't, that individual human beings learn a lot in their lifetimes. I don't think it's nature versus nurture. I think it's nature and nurture. But I think that the nature side has been gotten in short shrift in AI. Um, but that learning is only possible because our ancestors have evolved machinery for representing things like space, time, and enduring objects. And my prediction, and it's only a prediction, I won't be able to prove it, 
is that AI will work much better when we figure out how to incorporate similar in information into AI. It's logically possible, of course, that there could be lots of innate structure in humans, but we wouldn't need it for AI, and I'm sure we'll have discussion of that today. So neither of us is going to be able to prove our position today. We simply don't know. We don't, I haven't done the right empirical studies of AI with and without innate machinery to really be able to answer this question. But in a way, that's partly my point. It's an empirical question, and we haven't been gathering the right data. We haven't been looking at AI, AI models with nativist structure to compare them with ones that, that lack nativist structure. And I'm going to try to suggest there's good reason to take a more nativist position more seriously. So first question is, could the gap between machines and toddlers stem in part from a lack of innate machinery? Well, there's certainly lots of reasons to believe that there's uh, innate machinery in the hum human being. So anybody who has read Steven Pinker's book, and if you haven't read it, you should read it, um, the language instinct should be familiar with some of these arguments. I'm not going to go through them in detail, but I think there are a lot of them, ranging from poverty to stimulus arguments, which um, Pinker, of course, got from Noam Chomsky, saying you know, there's a limited amount of data, and yet you have an infinite language, to arguments about the relative speed at which toddlers learn language compared to learning lots of other things. So calculus is much harder than language. Why is that? Um, there's a robustness to input regimes. So some kids learn in upper middle class environments where there's a lot of correction maybe of the kids, or at least some, and focus on what the kids say. And there are other kids learn in environments where parents think talking to small kids is like talking to a plant. Why would you bother? Um, and still kids in those environments man manage to learn from incidental language quite well. And there's also dissociability from other cognitive functions. There's a long literature on nativism. I'm not going to go through all of this psychological literature today, but I'll just tell you it's ongoing. So there was a study that just came out in, in current biology which showed that um, not even newborns, but uh, kids in the womb could tell the difference between a face and an inverted face. So um, there was stimuli like in the top right, the little dots shown uh, to the kids through, through the um, womb they get a little blurry. That's what the next picture is supposed to show you. And it turns out kids like to look towards the one on the top, and they turn away from the one at the bottom. So there's a long set of studies like that. Um, people never like to believe in nativism about people, so I like to show them animals. Um, these are uh, baby ibexes climbing down a mountain. Um, they don't get to do million trial learning, right? If they make a mistake, <laughs> it's a problem. They might come close, but they don't actually. Okay. Deep learning typically presumes that most connectivity is determined by experience. We might have a chance to drill down on the details of this quote, but I think to a first approximation, it's right. And the initial wiring of deep networks is largely random. I know largely is not fully correct. I'm happy to talk about it later, but the first approximation, and that's true. But if you look at the brain, it's just not that way. So we've known since the time of Broadman that there are different brain areas. They do different things. There's a lot of differentiation. Um, I like this quote from David Hubel whose idea of um, hierarchical feature detectors underlies some of Jan's greatest work. Um, and uh, Hubel is no fan of this idea that you start with an initially random network. Um, and back to a first approximation, the structure of the brain doesn't require even internally generated experience, which was something popular a couple years ago. Um, you can actually cut off synaptic transmission using genetic tools. This was an article in Science in 1999, and there are pairs of pictures. And you look at a mouse that has this knockout that knocks out synaptic transmission, and you compare it to one that is a normal mouse, and you can't tell the difference until they're born. Uh, turns out synaptic transmission is very important once you're born. But you get a rough, uh, you die, right, if you don't have it. Um, but uh, you get a good rough draft, even without anything that, that plausibly could convey prenatal experience, et cetera. And that's because most of the genome is there in part, um, we can talk about the teleology of it later, but um, has evolved uh, such that it shapes the brain. So 99.5% of your genes are expressed in your brain at some point. And this is data from the Allen Brain Institute that'll be published in the next month or put online in the next month. Um, and most of those genes are expressed during the uh, process of development. A significant number of them are, are expressed in specific ways. They're there to make the brain have a particular structure, not just be a kind of uh, piece of spam at the beginning. And there are a lot of mechanisms for this, like high precision axon guidance, cell migration, all kinds of stuff, um, incidentally, that I talked about in the book, The Birth of the Mind. A large array of evolved mechanisms have, in fact, yielded greater precision in human brain development. So I'm not going to go through all of these, but there's a great um, review by Geshwin and Rakesh a, a couple years ago talking about all the specific mechanisms, like gene duplication, that have given us more precision for wiring up our brains in advance of experience than other creatures. So the view of um, innateness from biology that I, I put forward in The Birth of the Mind, and which I still 
believe to be correct a dozen years later, is that pre-wiring, first of all, doesn't preclude rewiring. People talk about nature versus nurture. That's a crock. Nature is what allows nurture to happen at all. And the fact that you have pre-wiring doesn't mean you can't have a lot of plasticity to rewire things. There's plenty of room in biology both for pre-wiring and, and for all kinds of learning. But there's also ample evidence that biological creatures start with strong starting points, which is a polite way of saying innate knowledge. Um, even before learning begins, there's ample machinery in the genome for, genome for wiring up. Initial circuitry, evolution has shaped that machinery, and Locke was just wrong. We're not blank slates. Now, of course, the next question is whether that matters for AI. I would say that we don't know because the field hardly ever even looks. So when we had this back and forth discussion, what are we going to debate about? Chalmers sends uh, out the, this text. He says, when I do a Google search on nativism and AI, I get a did you mean message. Like it's that rarely even discussed that he couldn't find a few basic web hits. There are a few in the 90s. Um, my point is that in the space of design choices for how you could build a neural network or machine learning system or an AI system, innate machinery usually gets ignored. So you have quotes like this. I totally agree with Jan on the first part. This was in an interview a couple weeks ago. Um, human children are very quick at learning human dialogue and learning common sense about the world. We think there's something we haven't uncovered yet. So we agree on what the problem is. And then Jan points to where he thinks the solution is, which is some sort of learning paradigm that we haven't figured out. Well, logically, that's certainly possible. And I bet we have a lot of things to figure out about learning paradigms. But also logically speaking, there are three different possibilities for reaching next level AI. Maybe we need better learning algorithms, which mind you are themselves innate. We can talk about that later. Um, but we might also need machinery for constraining what those algorithms are. And of course, I think the answer is likely to be both, that we're going to have to have better learning algorithms and we're going to have to have more innate constraints. If neural nets have taught us anything, it's that pure empiricism has its limits. So here's um, an illustration from a, a talk that was presented at NYU a couple weeks ago by DeepMind. Right, this is the um, company that has solved, or the subsidiary of, of Alphabet, that has solved Go, right? They, they know how to play Go. But when they try to learn language by having a little character wander a simple world and have labeled objects, they do terribly. So it's a kind of slightly complex neural network, but not anything too far from the standard. And then you look at the data, and it learns things. There's 59 words it learns. And it takes it 2 million trials to learn 59 words. Anybody who knows the developmental literature would be really worried about that. If you had a child that took 2 million trials, you would have spent a lot of time in the speech pathologist's office and you'd be very, very upset. Kids can learn things in, in a single trial sometimes. Um, and then you go over, over to things like negation, stay away from the fridge, and it's even worse. It's so bad that in the archive paper that they described this, they didn't include the negation, but the guy showed it, um, and I tried to quickly take uh, shots on my camera. <laughs> so, Look, what I said in the New Yorker when I first wrote about deep learning as such, when the term first became popular, is deep learning is a better ladder, but a better ladder doesn't necessarily get you to the moon. I would stand by that. The amazing thing is that some other people have started to agree with me. This is Jeff Hinton, who is kind of often seen as the father of deep learning, although Jan invented convolutional networks, which are an extremely important addition. Um, so, I mean, you know, he's one of the co-founders with, with Jan, Yasha Benvio, and so forth. And he's saying maybe backpropagation isn't the right thing. Maybe we need to start over. You can read this in Axios. I think maybe it got cut off um, a couple weeks ago. Meanwhile, innate constraints often play an unacknowledged yet vital role in getting neural networks to actually work. So here's the Nature paper about AlphaGo. Um, and you look at the top figure and you say, oh, it's a neural network. They solve Go with a neural network. Isn't that amazing? And then you read interviews with Demis Hassabis, and that's the impression you get, because he says, the most significant aspect of all of this is that AlphaGo isn't just an expert system built with handcrafted rules. Uh, instead, it uses general machine learning techniques to win at Go. It sounds like you know another victory for empiricism, for deep learning, and so forth. But if you look carefully, they have another thing in there, which is called Monte Carlo tree search. A lot of the subtext of the debate we're having here is about symbol manipulation versus neural networks. Monte Carlo tree search is a technique that has come directly from symbol manipulation. It says you have an explicit representation of abstract trees, which is one of the things that I argued for in the algebraic mind and that everybody said was ridiculous. But now, when, when it's down in the trenches, people use it. Um, it's actually even worse than that. So buried in the tables um, is extended data table two, the input features for the neural network. So rather than learning from pixels, which is what DeepMind's famous Atari game system does, they actually learn not only from pixels, but from features like the number of liberties after a move. And my favorite is sensibleness, whether a move is legal and does not fill its own eyes. So there's a little innate feature detector that says, that's too dumb. You would never, ever bother to do that. 
So there's innateness, but it's not principled innateness. What I think we need to do is to look at innateness in a principled way in the context of machine learning, which I don't think anybody has done a whole lot of, though I will give you an example in a moment. Um, so what should we be looking for? I love this quote from Liz Spelke. It was in Cognition in 1994, in a special issue. This is volume 50 of Cognition. And she said, if children are endowed innately with abilities to perceive objects, persons, sets, and places, then they may use their perceptual experience to learn about the properties and behaviors of such entities. And then she makes what some people call a learnability argument, which basically says, I don't know how you would get here if you didn't have that stuff in the first place. I think she's pointing to exactly the right sorts of things that we should be building in innately. Capacity to perceive objects, persons, sets, and places. I've made a number of proposals like this, and this is sort of a synthesis of her proposal and mine and a couple others, uh, but a lot of mine were in the algebraic mind. So representations of objects, structured algebraic representations, operations over variables, a type token distinction, a capacity to represent sets, locations, paths, trajectories, obstacles, enduring individuals, a way of representing the affordance of objects, spatiotemporal contiguity, causality, translational invariance, capacity for cost-benefit analysis. You can think of this as my rough open, opening bid. How much more do we need? And what do we mean by more? Well, we need more than we have now. Most models don't have much of this except one that I'll talk about later. Most of them ignore it, and I think they get into trouble as a consequence. Um, of course, there could be much more innateness than that. I mean, you know, I'm only in the middle of the spectrum. Pinker wrote a book called The Language Instinct that I recommended a few minutes ago um, that ends with a proposal for 15 adapted, evolved modules that do things like intuitive mechanics, intuitive biology, uh, habitat selection, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what we really need, I think, in fact, is systematic, thoughtful analyses of what happens when we embed differing amounts of innate machinery into machine learning. So happens that somebody actually did this once. I, there's not a lot of papers in the literature, but here's a great one called um, Generalization and Network Design Strategies um, that looks at five different models that differ in their amount of nativism. So the top one is the simplest kind of neural network you can imagine. It doesn't even have a hidden layer, so it doesn't have any nonlinearities. And by the end, the author has invented this brilliant thing called convolution that completely changed the world. It builds in the notion of translation invariance, essentially, wiring it into a neural network so you can recognize an object in different places without having to experience in all of them. Um, of course, uh, uh, when the conclusion was, as expected, generalization performance goes up as you have fewer free parameters to deal with, and importantly, as the amount of built-in knowledge goes up. Um, the author of that is sitting over there and will join us in a moment. So to wrap up so far, and I do have a little bit more to say, um, we don't know precisely what is innate in people. Even if people are chock full of innate stuff, it's possible we wouldn't need innate stuff for machines. But sheer bottom-up statistics hasn't gotten us very far on an important set of problems. And these are the ones I pointed out in that New Yorker article I mentioned earlier uh, five years ago, language, reasoning, planning, common sense. Even after 60 years of neural network research, even after we have vastly better computation, much more memory, much better data, and I think the field has invested disproportionately in models that lack principled innate machinery. 90 plus percent of papers at NIPS, for example, which is probably the leading AI conference at the moment, um, don't have, say anything about innateness. So maybe it's time we give innateness a chance. I want to say a little bit about unsupervised learning, because I'm sure there's going to be a focus for Jan. Um, unsupervised learning can mean different things. So one is, like, I show you a bunch of animals, and you know, just one at a time, not so neatly classified as this, and you use a technique like clustering to try to figure out which ones um, go together. That's not probably the sense of unsupervised learning that Jan will talk about today. Um, but he is very interested in unsupervised learning systems as a way to get to common sense. What he has in mind is basically you see videos. You see a bunch of frames of a video, and you try to predict the next frames of the video. You don't have a teacher there kind of telling you about the world. You just observe the world, watch it go forward, and try to get better and better at prediction. I'm not sure you can do that. Um, Eros Cimicelli and I were talking the other day. He gave a great quote, which is, you can't model the probability distribution function for the whole world because the world's too complicated. So maybe Jan's approach can work, but I think there's reason to be skeptical in terms of how complex the problem is itself. Um, there are related systems, neither Jan nor I like very much, but that show a problem that I think might arise. So this is um, DeepMind's A3C algorithm, which is like the Atari game system thing, but faster. And my company, Geometric Intelligence, trained it on a kind of slalom race for a race car. It learned from pixels, as, as they famously do. And then we played a fiendish trick, which was we moved around the obstacles. And it crashed into the obstacles repeatedly. Um, what is the lesson from that? Well, the lesson is if you learn things from pixels, you tend to learn things at the wrong level of abstraction. So what you want to learn is like go in between the posts. But the particular system that I'm critiquing, which is not, mind you, Jan's system, 
um, doesn't really have an abstract representation of a post or a flying or anything like that. When I talk about um, unsupervised learning, which I do think is a good thing, but in a different way, I think about my daughter, Chloe. She's sitting here at Whole Foods in Vancouver over the summer, and she notices this is a reenactment. This is the second time she did this. I didn't have the presence of mind to catch her the first time. But she reenacted it for me. So she looks at the, the chair, and she says, I mean, I'm going to you know, put words in her mouth that she didn't actually say. She looks at the chair, and she says, I wonder if I could climb through that. Now, this is not 10 million trials. She never saw the Dukes of Hazard, so it's not copying a television program. Um, and she tries to do it. So she has a hypothesis about what she wants to do. She's thought about the apertures of the chair, her own body. She actually gets stuck. And then she does problem solving. How can I get my arm through? And then eventually she makes it. So unsupervised learning as currently understood in machine learning, I don't think does anything like what my three-year-old was doing here. It's not about forming goals or plans. It's not about determining affordances. It's not about problem solving. I'm not against unsupervised learning. I suspect we'll talk about it a bunch. But my bet is that it will only succeed if it's performed using a system that has a richer set of primitives and representations than just pixels. And that that's where the innate structure comes in. So last thing I'll say, the last little section, and I'll finish on time, I guess, um, is there's actually a ton of innateness in every neural network. And so the real issue is not even how much, but whether we have the right kind of innateness. So I made a list of some of the things that are innate to every neural network model. So every neural network model has an architecture. How many layers? What types of layers? How many units in each layer? How do those units interconnect? There are a bunch of representational uh, choices. What should the input units stand for? In the 90s, people played around with almost everything but pixels, because they didn't have enough computational power to do it with pixels. Nowadays, they tend to use pixels on the input, but it is a free parameter. And we saw that in the Go paper, we saw um, input units for things like the number of liberties a stone has on a Go board, which are not pixels. Um, uh, network dynamics, what is the activity function of a unit? So a unit tabulates a bunch of data, and then it makes a decision. Do I have enough um, to fire? Well, there's free parameters there. There's free parameters about how you should change the units um, over time, depending on whether they make errors. What algorithms should do the training? There's also a free parameter that's almost like innate to the teacher. So all these models have a teacher that provide input to the models, and people play games with that. So the, the um, DeepMind paper with language a whole section of the guy's talk was about what he called curriculum design, or something like uh, curriculum design, which was basically like, we have to teach it on the simple problems before the hard problems, or it doesn't work well. I didn't have to do that with my three-year-old. I just talked to her, and, and she learned the language. Same with my four-and-a-half-year-old. The real question is, what kind of innateness do we want? So if you haven't seen this XKCD cartoon, um, I, well, I guess you get to see it now. Um, it's making fun of the kind of state of the art of machine learning, and I don't think it's entirely unfair. It says, one guy says to the other, this is your machine learning system. And the other guy says, yeah, you pour the data into this big pile of linear algebra, and then you collect answers on the other side. And the other guy says, well, what if the answers are wrong? And the guy says, well, you just stir the pile until they start looking right. This is a lot of what happens in machine learning. And it's a kind of claim about nativism. It's a claim that you need the right piles of linear algebra in order to predict the particular piles of, of data that you've got. But here's another um, theory. Is that we want the kinds of things that kids have, which are representations and primitives that are built for comprehending the behavior of objects and entities, the physics of the world. So you should be able to look at that. And even if you haven't seen videos of twisty slides, as we call them in my house, um, with that exact shape, you should be able to predict which, what's going to happen next. And there you go. Thank you very much. And now, Jan LeCun. Great. Thanks very much, Gary. Now, please welcome Jan LeCun. All right. It's really, it's really nice to speak after Gary. I get the advantage of having a few minutes to reflect about what he talked about. I'm really thankful that you used a lot of my uh, slides and quotes. Okay. All right, so that, does AI need uh, more innate machinery? Um, the answer probably is yes, but the answer is probably also not nearly as much as what Gary thinks. 
So I have a confession to make, which I made to some of you um, a few months ago when David uh, organized a, a meeting on the ethics of AI, which is that I got interested in machine learning through philosophy. Um, I was a young uh, student in engineering, and I stumbled on this book, uh, the debate between uh, Chomsky and Piaget on uh, language learning. And um, Piaget and Chomsky brought their teams of uh, uh, you know, people to argue for their side. And there was, you know, a lot of arguments for uh, innate machinery for language. And uh, of course, Piaget is uh, an advocate of uh, kind of st structure in learning and stages of learning, etc. cetera. Um, but in that, in, in, among his team was uh, a, a gentleman by the name of uh, Seymour Papert, who was a computer scientist and mathematician at MIT, who had worked on the perceptron, which was sort of the original uh, model from the 50s that was one of the first models that was capable of learning. And I learned about uh, the existence of or the possibility of machines uh, learning at the time, and that's what got me into the field. So I got into machine learning through philosophy. For some of you, I guess, that's interesting. I, I you know, I exited philosophy almost immediately after that, but um, um, but it has a special uh, place in my, uh, uh, in my mind. So uh, I think there's a number of, uh, of, of questions we can ask ourselves. And uh, there's at least a few things that the, the list of seven things that Gary mentioned, uh, there's, there's one point that he kind of said implicitly, which is uh, all of these AI systems that we see, none of them is real AI in the sense that, and this is a quote that I, uh, I stole from uh, Josh Tenenbaum uh, that he said at a, a conference on computational uh, uh, neuroscience just uh, a few weeks ago in, at Columbia. And this is true. So current AI in the form of deep learning or various other implementations of AI is not true AI in the sense that it's nowhere near the capabilities that we observe in animals and humans. And so um, none of the techniques that we have can build representations of the world, uh, either through structure or through learning, that uh, are, are you know, any match for what we observe in uh, animals and humans. So I would agree with, with Gary in the sense that we do need uh, for AI, we need systems that have representations of the world, that have uh, the potential uh, the possibility of symbol manipulation, that have um, uh, uh, abstract uh, representations of uh, um, you know, various constraints in the world. The question is, are those learned? And how much prior information are, are required for, for learning them? And I think where we differ, perhaps, is uh, how much we uh, need to build in for those uh, structures to emerge. So, all of my uh, uh, career, at least in, uh, uh, when it comes to machine learning and AI, has been at trying to find the minimum amount of structure to uh, allow a machine to actually learn things and at a reasonable amount, uh, uh, level of performance. And uh, I'm a scientist as well as an engineer, and uh, the, I, I think one way of validating whether such concepts are, uh, are good is to actually build machines that work based on those principles and then sort of use that as evidence for the necessity or non-necessity of, of structure. So the history of AI over the last, or at least certain parts of AI, over the last uh, 30 or 40 years in areas like speech recognition, like image recognition, and like natural language understanding has been to go from more structure to less structure. Uh, there was a famous quote from... Uh, uh, Fred Jelinek, who was uh, a pioneer in speech recognition uh, at IBM, and uh, we eventually went to Johns Hopkins. And what he said was, um, you know, we had linguists in our, in our group uh, to, to do speech recognition, to sort of, you know, have some uh, knowledge, basic knowledge about, about language. And every linguist I fire, my error rate goes down by, by 10%. Now, <laughs> that said, I apologize to all the linguists in the room. Um, <laughs> This is not my quote. And he actually claims he never said that. Um, he said, actually, I'm actually too nice to fire any, anybody. But, um, <laughs> but this was sort of reported as kind of a half joke. Uh, what, what, it re what it reflects, what, what it, uh, the, the indication of this is the fact that uh, the less structure you put in the system and the more you rely on learning and data, the better it works. And that, that has been certainly my experience. That's been the experience. And you can just observe the evolution of, uh, of AI over the last uh, few decades, and you, you will see that trend uh, in, in very obvious ways. So um, 
what AI really means today, where the reason why we hear about AI, I mean, AI is a, is a field that has, you know, a, a history of various uh, false starts and various uh, contributions that after a few years uh, were, co were called differently than AI. So for example, you know, the algorithm that your GPS uses to plan a, a path between two, uh, two cities, that's in every AI textbook. We don't consider this AI anymore. It's just, you know, a, a star algorithm or whatever to do path planning. Uh, tree exploration to play chess. Uh, that's also in every AI textbook. Um, but, you know, it's just tree exploration now. We kind of know how to do this. Um, in recent years, AI has become synonymous with learning. And it didn't used to be this way. And there's a, a whole area of AI that has nothing to do with learning. Um, it doesn't mean it's not interesting. But the reason why we hear about AI in the last five years so much is because of learning, and particularly deep learning. Now, what does that mean? It means supervised learning. So supervised learning consists in... Um, training a machine in a similar way that we would train, uh, that we would show a picture book to a child. So, uh, except it's considerably less efficient. So you have a machine which is basically a parameterized function that has knobs on it, on it that you can adjust that uh, you know, basically determine the input-output function of the machine. And you want to train the machine to distinguish cars from airplanes. You show thousands of examples of cars, thousands of examples of airplanes. And every time you show a car and the machine doesn't say car, you adjust the knobs so that next time around you show the same picture the output is closer to when you want. That's supervised learning. You basically tell the machine the answer you want, and it learns to associate the input to the output. So this very kind of input-output, um, there's no sort of internal state to the, the system, so it's okay for perception, but probably not for, for anything else. There's no reasoning or anything like that. And it's supervised in the sense that you need to have data that has been annotated by, by humans. And the problem with this is that it limits the type of information that the machine can learn about the world. It's basically things that humans have, uh, have labeled. So that's a very strong limitation. But it used to be what, what, uh, what, what the appearance uh, or the, the preponderance, the recent, recent preponderance of machine learning has caused in the field of uh, computer vision, speech recognition, and other fields of this type is, uh, is the ability to learn task end-to-end -end with very little uh, sort of hardwired uh, machinery in the system. There is structure, but there's very little sort of hardwired machinery in it. Um, so it used to be that to build a pattern recognition system using supervised learning, you would have to kind of hardwire a lot of structure in the what's called a feature extractor that takes the raw signal and turns it into an appropriate representation that then is simple enough for a simple learning algorithm to figure out. Um, and over the, the last uh, several decades, the, the deep learning model would consist in basically stacking uh, modules which are all trainable, uh, allowed us to train those machines end to end, basically without having too much hardwiring. So the, that's an indication of the direction of history of, uh, you know, removing hardwiring as much as we can, removing innate uh, structure as much as we can uh, uh, over the course of history. And every time we've done this, uh, which was enabled either by new algorithms, larger data sets, or faster computers, uh, the accuracy of pattern recognition, system, pattern recognition systems has gone up. Has, has gone up. Um, that said, as Gary pointed out, there is a lot of structure in those, in those systems. They are not randomly connected or fully connected neural nets. Uh, there is a lot of structure. And in fact, I kind of built my career around the idea of building structure into neural nets, something called convolutional nets. Um, and I don't know how you managed to dig up the first paper on this, but that's pretty much the first paper on this. Huh? It's on my website, but you know, it's, it's far down the list, so nobody kind of uh, looks at this. You know. <laughs> um, and convolutional nets are actually inspired by uh, biology, so weakly inspired by the architecture of the visual cortex. So there is structure in the visual cortex in the way, uh, so this is you know, classic work in neuroscience, Nobel Prize winning work, as a matter of fact, by Hugo and Weasel uh, about the architecture of the visual cortex that you know, identifies simple cells and complex cells and, and sort, of a, a, sort of a hierarchy of layers. And, and people have had the idea of implementing computer models that of, of, of that, that sort of were capable of doing very simple pattern recognition tasks. Uh, one in particular is Fukushima's neurocognitron, which is kind of represented here on the left. So this idea of hierarchy of local connections, shifting variants, as, as Larry was, uh, was mentioning, is at the basis of convolutional nets, and that's what makes it work. And a lot of the applications of AI that you see today, so things like, you know, you, you talk to your phone and it recognizes your voice, it's a convolutional net. The, if you go on Facebook and the post is being translated, uh, from one language to another one. Chances are it's a convolutional net. Uh, we don't do it for all pair, pairs of languages, but for common pairs of languages, it's actually a convolutional net. Um, 
your image, images are being recognized as a convolutional net. The car, your car is, you know, drives itself on the highway. It's a convolutional net doing the vision. So this, has, uh, this is used a lot. And it's just a little bit of structure. It's not a huge amount of innate machinery. Um, and that's enough. So my quest has been to minimize the amount of innate machinery that will enable a machine to uh, learn with whatever data we have uh, available. Um, and you can recognize characters, multiple characters. In the last few years, people have uh, figured out how to implement this on GPUs and run this on uh, object recognition. And those things can essentially recognize you know, obscure breeds of dogs and you know, uh, uh, species of plants and, and uh, uh, of birds and things like this to a degree of accuracy that is higher than most people in this room, unless you are a bird watcher. Um, so those things are incredibly accurate uh, on, on kind of standard data sets. Um, but they are subject to uh, failures, and some of which are, 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 are not so great. Um, there's been sort of a, a so I'm, I'm going to kind of contradict something that Gary said. He said, um, you look at the uh, NIFS papers, and nobody has any principled uh, idea about you know, what kind of machinery and innate machinery should be there. It's, it's all about uh, you know, kind of learning methods, et cetera. It's actually exactly the opposite. Almost every paper is about new architectures, new ways of connecting neurons and modules with, uh, uh, with each other in such a way as to solve a, a new problem. Like almost all of the papers are about this. So here's an example. There is uh, the evolution of the architectures that are used, uh, particular convolutional net type architectures that are used for object recognition over the last uh, several years. Uh, they all have a name, AlexNet, DGG, GoogleNet, or GoogleNet, ResNet, DanceNet. I mean, there is a, a menagerie of all those things. And they, they are all special uh, architectures. Um, so this works very well for, for vision. It works very well for speech recognition. It works very well for um, certain types of language understanding. And we might ask why. And the, this idea of having layer is, layers is, is a structure. The idea of having local connections is a structure. We might ask, why does this work? And it's probably because the world is compositional. So the perceptual world is compositional. The world itself is compositional. Uh, objects are made of parts and parts of subparts, subparts of motifs, motifs of uh, particular arrangements of edges and things like this. I mean, there's uh, um, a lot of uh, uh, work on this in, 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 in visual psychology as well as uh, neuroscience and, and various other fields. And so to some extent, the structure is a reflection of the structure of the world. But um, you know, is inspired originally by uh, very weakly by by, by neuroscience. Um, so here is how far we can push this model of supervised learning. We can push it quite far. We can do things like uh, label every pixel in the image with the category of the object it belongs to, which means that we can identify if a piece of a road is uh, traversable or not, which means you can build self-driving cars, and that has societal consequences. It works. It requires a lot of engineering, um, but it. You know, it works and we'll have this in every car within 10 years, 20 years, something like that. Uh, conceptually, very simple neural net architecture with some structure, but not a huge amount of structure, just, you know, a lot of uh, 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 training. Can do things like basically recognize every object in, the, in an image, outline them, and, uh, you know, figure out exactly what they are. Uh, and, there, you know, again, there is structure in those networks, but a very, very small amount of structure when you think about it in terms of... Uh, I don't know the equivalent amount of information that would be required in a, a kind of a virtual genome of those machines is actually relatively small. The, the, the length of the program that specifies the architecture of those systems is very short. It's one page or something like this. Um, but you can do sort of pretty amazing things of, uh, you know, you, you can push the system quite, quite, fa quite far in terms of performance. You can train them to do uh, language translation as I was mentioning before. So there's a number of questions that pop up there. Is this sufficient? for building um, truly intelligent machines. And as I said before, I don't believe that's sufficient. And I'll, I'll point, pinpoint uh, a few problems that uh, um, I've, I've uh, identified along, along this, uh, this dimension. So there are questions. Um, you know, we can do supervised perception, as I showed. But what about things like reasoning or you know, episodic memory, right? We read a text, and we can sort of answer questions about this text. How do we remember? How do we kind of you know, represent? Uh, uh, the, the, the story that we just read uh, in our head that allows us to, to answer questions about it or to uh, summarize it or, or to kind of imagine a follow-up you know, a, 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 a follow to, uh, to this story. 
Um, and that, you know, ultimately asks, you know, do we need to build special structure for all of those things into the machine, or will the machine learn this uh, uh, spontaneously? So that's the old nature-nurture debate, of course, uh, which is why we're here. There's a couple of other questions. So this is another thing that Larry talks about in some of his books. Um, there are some of us in the field of, of machine learning, deep learning in particular, or neural nets, uh, and, and people in neuroscience also, who work under the hypothesis, true or false, that there is some underlying principle in the way the, the brain learns, or the, the, the brain uh, sort of organizes itself through perception and action. And one question, for example, is that, is there a single learning algorithm? We can't really call it an algorithm, but sort of learning principle or, method or, or, or uh, procedure uh, in the cortex? Or are there more like 50? Or is the question nonsensical in the sense that it's just a big collection of clues and hacks, and there is no way there is, we will find any uh, underlying principle? So I'm, you know, whether this, the hypothesis that there is a single or a few uh, learning algorithms that uh, in, in the cortex is true or false, I work under the assumption that it's true. And uh, the idea, the, the, the uh, methodology being that uh, we try to build machines that have a relative, you know, a minimal number of underlying uh, principles and moving parts that uh, exhibit behaviors that we expect from animals and machines. Um, so we don't really know the answer to this, but uh, it would be nice if there was an underlying principle. So perhaps an analogy to this is um, uh, flight. Uh, there is an underlying principle to flight, whether this applies to airplanes uh, or birds or helicopters. Uh, it's the same principle, the same underlying principle, right? The Bernoulli principle for generating lift uh, by pushing something through the air. And the details might be extremely different, but there is an underlying principle. So one question we might ask ourselves is, is there an underlying principle behind uh, animal and human learning or learning in general or AI, you know, intelligence in general, whether it's artificial or natural? Uh, and I think it's a, a perfectly good uh, working hypothesis to assume that, that there is. Um, I'll skip the other questions. All right, but as Gary mentioned, and there is uh, at least a few experts here who have thought about the question of uh, you know, getting machines to acquire common sense. Uh, Ernie Davis here is, you know, is kind of thinking about this for 30 years, something like that, more perhaps. Um, is, you know, none of the method methods that we've developed, the learning methods we've developed, whether it's supervised learning or reinforcement learning so far, uh, are powerful enough to allow machines to develop enough knowledge about the world to kind of have common sense. So when you talk to your, you know, personal assistant, you know, Siri or, Alexa, Google Now, whatever it is, uh, it has a very, very shallow understanding of what, what you tell it. And uh, in fact, most of those things are completely scripted by humans. There is very little learning going on there. Uh, those systems have been built by hand uh, and, and engineered, not trained, or there's very, very little uh, training. There's training in the speech recognition part, but no training in the kind of reasoning and question answering part, essentially. And if you deviate from the kind of scenarios that they've been built for, they, they can't answer. They either don't understand the question or they tell you a joke or, you know. Um, so we, we haven't solved this, this question of common sense. So the first question you might ask is what is common sense? And we, we may, you know, there's probably diff very different opinions about what common sense is in this room. Uh, but one, uh, one way that I think about it is common sense is the ability to fill in the blanks. So we have a partial view of the world through our, our perception. And uh, because of our knowledge of how the world works, we can complete the information that's missing. So for example, when we observe uh, a particular situation, we can probably predict to some extent what's going to happen next. And that's because we have predictive models of the world that allows us to make those, those predictions that we've learned by observation and also by interacting with the world. Um, so predicting the future is a particular, a special case of filling in the blanks. Uh, right now you're, you're, seeing the, you're seeing my face, you don't see the back of my head, but you can, you know, even if you haven't seen it before, you have a pretty good idea what it, what it looks like because you kind of have an intuitive model of what human, uh, human heads uh, are supposed to look like. Um, you know, we all have a, a blind spot in our, in our retina and we're not conscious of it because our brain kind of fills in the missing information there. 
So, so predicting any part of uh, information from any other part of it is, uh, or the ability to do this at a kind of high level uh, is I think what uh, kind of the main, uh, um, um, what would I say, um, instance or, or manifestation of, of common sense. Um, and, and we see this in, in children, right? So uh, children learn very basic facts about the world extremely quickly. So things like you know, object permanence. You know, kids uh, learn this you know, at the age of two months, roughly, the fact that an object is still there even if it's hidden. Uh, you know, peekaboo is so funny because you, know, you hide and you're not there anymore, right? Um, and you know, we're not the only ones to have uh, some sense of, uh, uh, some level of common sense. There is this orangutan here. You know, they don't have any language. They're not even social animals. They live solitary lives. And this guy is playing a magic trick on him and the orangutan is rolling on the floor laughing, right? Because the object in the cup disappeared and he didn't notice. So obviously he has some model of the world that was broken here that made it really funny. And you know, psychologists, um, so this is uh, a couple of slides that I uh, borrowed from uh, Emmanuel Dupou, who is a cognitive neuroscientist uh, uh, in Paris where he kind of uh, tries to figure out at what stage uh, babies learn basic concepts uh, of intuitive physics, for example, about the world. Um, and you measure this by uh, looking at babies and, and, and how surprised they are by something. So you know, before the, the age of eight months, if you push a little car, uh, you know, basically um, you make it look like it floats in the air. Babies like say, sure, that's the way the world works, no problem. After eight months, they look like the little girl here at the bottom left. They, they're like this, and they say, what's going on? <laughs> they don't say it, but they, th you know, they think it. Um, and so we made this chart of, you know, at what stage do we learn all those concepts? And you know, the, the, the question is whether those are pre-existing concepts that just happen to kind of, during development, appear at a particular stage, or whether they are actually learned from, from data, if you want, from scratch, from interaction with the world or from observation. Um, uh, at that point. And so face tracking happens within minutes. And you know, we actually have computational models that basically can train to track faces within minutes of training, of, of equivalent real-time training. So this could be learned extremely quickly in humans. Um, uh, you know, the identification of uh, inanimate objects versus animate objects, you know, biological motion, object permanence, uh, stability of, uh, and support. Uh, gravity, so we learn gravity about around eight months. The, the fact that objects that are not supported will fall. Uh, and you know, there's kind of a similar chart for sort of more linguistic and social concepts. Um, so you know, babies and, and certainly animals learn this by just observing the world, by play, you know, playing in it, interacting it with, with it. But, but human babies are kind of helpless in the first few months. They don't interact the world with the world very much. Most of what they learn about the world is by observation, very little action actually. And how do we do this? And this is probably what allows us to learn, for example, that the world is three-dimensional, right? So here is an example of how we can learn the notion of depth using predictive learning. So by um, training ourselves to predict what the world is going to look like when something happens. So if I move my head 20 centimeters to the left, the world changes according to sort of parallax, right? Objects that are near kind of move more than objects that are far. And uh, the notion of object can emerge from this. The notion of depth emerges from this. So if I, if I want to train uh, a machine or myself to uh, predict what the world is going to look like when I move my head 20 centimeters to the left, inevitably, uh, whatever entity I train is going to have to represent the notion of depth, because that's the best way to explain uh, how, how the world changes. Okay, so, so that's an argument for the idea that this sort of uh, you know, way of uh, training, training yourself by predicting the future or predicting missing information that you eventually observe um, is, is, is how we learn so much about how the world works. Um, in fact, um, that's an argument that Jeff Hinton has made uh, many times that uh, we, we need, if we need to, if we want our brains, our brains are extremely powerful, you know, statistical engines, if you want, or, or learning machines with many, many parameters. And if we want to have enough data to constrain our brain to learn anything, our brain needs to predict everything from everything else. It needs to have this ability of predicting the future from the past or train itself to predict the future from the past, predict you know, uh, the hidden parts of a, 
of the world from, from the ones that we see and eventually kind of look around to, to get what the correct answer is, you know, things of that type. Um, so in the, in the context uh, of uh, machine learning, there is sort of three categories, three paradigms, main paradigms of learning. Reinforcement learning, supervised learning, which I mentioned, and unsupervised uh, learning or predictive learning in the way I, I described it. And reinforcement learning, I, I, I sort of use this uh, analogy that reinforcement learning is like the, the cherry on a cake. If uh, intelligence is a cake, reinforcement learning is the cherry on the cake because the amount of information you ask the machine to predict is basically just a single, a single scalar value of how well it's doing, not more. And so it's getting very little feedback from the world, which means that, as Gary uh, uh, correctly mentioned, um, if we use pure reinforcement learning to, to train ourselves to drive, we would probably have to crash in a tree about 50,000 times before we learn that it's the bad idea. And that, of course, doesn't work. And this is the state of reinforcement learning today. It only works for games. It doesn't work in the real world. And the reason is because it requires so many trials that you have to run the real world or the world that you're interacting with faster than real time otherwise. Um, and you have to do things that are not dangerous that won't kill you. So we cannot train self-driving cars with reinforcement learning today because of that problem. Now, why do we, as humans, why don't we have to crash into a tree 50,000 times before we realize a bad idea? It's because we have a good predictive model of the world. We know what's going to happen uh, you know, if we uh, you know, deviate from a proper trajectory and, and, and hit a tree. Uh, we have that, this ability to predict. In fact, I would argue intelligence, the essence of intelligence is the ability to predict. Um, in fact, this is something that um, uh, the, one of the sort of founders of reinforcement learning said a long time ago, uh, Rich Sutton in 1991 proposed an architecture where basically a machine would learn a model of the world first and then use this model of the world to plan. Um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit and kind of go to the, I mean, I've kind of given the punchline. <laughs> uh, this is famous poem, right? The revolution will not be televised. Um, uh, it will not be supervised, that's for sure. And, and so um, what's missing today, I think, is not more structure, although people do work on innate structure, prior, prior uh, machinery, yeah, innate machinery for machine learning systems. In fact, some of those um, I actually wanted to uh, show quickly. There is a lot of work on uh, particular architectures of neural nets today that are designed for handling language. And so language seems to be, you know, it's a kind of a sequ sequential signal with structure in it. And it seems that you need, you know, a particular type of structure to handle language. Um, although, you know, for translation, we use convolutional nets, which are very similar to what we use for images. So it's not like we need to put in there anything that's really special about language, but there is a need for structure. Um, but my uh, main argument is that what's missing is not so much the structure, although we are missing structure. What's missing is uh, principle that will allow our machine to learn how the world works by observation and by interaction with the world. Learning predictive world model is what we're missing today. And in my opinion, it's the biggest obstacle to significant progress in AI. And structure will come. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. By the way, just a uh, comment on the topic of predictive processing. That's actually the topic of our next debate in the, uh, in the spring. Um, there'll be a debate on the role of predictive coding and predictive processing in theories of perception involving David Heger, Lucia Maloney, Andy Clark, and Michael Briscola. Dates soon to be announced. So look forward to that one. Okay, now we're going to have uh, Gary, who has eight minutes to respond. So as I predicted, uh, we agree about a great deal. Um, I think we agree about the importance of having better predictive models, although I didn't stress that, but I certainly think that it's true. Um, we both agree that RL, reinforcement learning as practiced now, has no chance of doing that, that it takes many, many, two tr many trials, can't do it in the real world. Um, we actually disagree on the cognitive development literature. So I actually think that the evidence for object permanence being innate is pretty strong, and at any rate, I think it's very clearly present by four months. There's lots of experiments by Liz Spelke, Renee Bayer-Jean, Karen Wynn, and so forth that I think are very much consistent with object permanence being there at four months. And it might actually be present even earlier with the right methodology. So my own um, uh, most famous contribution to the developmental literature was an experiment that showed that 
babies could learn rules at eight months. It was published in Science in 1999. And what happens in that field is people come along and say, well, I can find kids who can do it even younger, so na na. So there's now a paper showing that the rule learning stuff that I described can, there's a missing control, but it seems to show that, that newborns can do it. At the same time, I want to add, by the way, that just because something isn't there at birth doesn't mean it's not innate. So um, facial hair in, in uh, human adult males appears you know, relatively late in life. There's a lot of maturation, I believe, in, in the brain that means some things happen, especially in humans because of the, the birth canal relative to the head size, that just gets baked after you're, you're outside the womb. Um, so if you do see something in eight months, it's not a knockdown argument that it's actually learned as, a, as opposed to developing. So stereopsis is interesting in this regard. Like it, it happens faster in monkeys than humans, um, but I don't think it's because the monkeys are quicker studies. I think it's because there's a different developmental clock. Um, the most important place where we actually, I think, disagree is on the significance of history. So um, and in two ways. So, so you're making an inductive argument. You're saying that because um, history shows that sort of less and less uh, allows us to do more and more, which I believe is true in the case that you described, that we, we shouldn't add more and more. Um, so it's true in the case that you described. So for perception and pattern recognition, maybe not for understanding a scene, but identifying an object, I think it's fine to have a deep learning system acquire the features. Um, you get into problems in complex scenes. So I didn't show my favorite um, scene of a captioning system misidentifying a parking sign with stickers as a refrigerator filled with food and drink. So there are still some bugs in the system, and I think you'd acknowledge you're smiling. Um, so it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. It's a pretty good architecture for that, and I would take your point there. But I don't think even there that it's fully correct that less is more. So it's true there's a lot of learning. But I think historically the most important thing in getting object recognition to work is that paper by you that I put up on the screen. Right? If you take away convolution, then you're back to multi-layer perceptrons, and they don't really work. Right? I mean, we know they don't really work. You showed it nicely, and there's a million studies since then um, that have shown that in one way or another. So what I was mostly arguing about in the algebraic mind was multi-layer perceptrons that didn't have convolution. There's one thing I would change. Well, there are two things I would change. One of the two things I would change about that book if I wrote a revised edition is I would have paid more attention to convolution, which I knew about dimly but didn't at that time appreciate the significance of. But that's a major piece of innate structure that has really changed the field. Uh, Jürgen Schmidhuber invented in his, with his students the, the LSTM, which is a way of adding memory to a particular kind of neural network. And that's used everywhere. I mean, his technique and your two techniques are the backbone of most of the field, but they're new pieces of innate structure. Schmidt Huber's, I still don't really understand. I don't ex exactly understand what an LSTM is doing. I know roughly why it works is in terms of it allows you to have memory. And of course, the memory networks are another way to do that at a different scale. Um, convolution is just transparently a representation of translation invariance translated into a neural network. It's beautiful. All I want is more of that stuff. And I think it's actually worked. And the trend actually goes the other way. So that's, that's the first half of that argument. The second half of the argument is what works for perception doesn't work for cognition, as far as I can tell. So you can fake it. You can confuse yourself. And I think this is the entire literature, is neural network cognitive science literature, is based on a confusion here. So if you have a limited data domain, you can emulate abstraction by memorizing all the cases or a bunch of key cases and generalizing within a space of training examples that you've seen before. But if you move out of that space of training examples, things fall apart. And so when people build language models using neural networks, they do really well on some sentences. And then they get these ridiculous errors like the refrigerator um, with, with food and drinks. Um, this is always, in my view, I can't prove it to you, but um, it is always a matter of generalizing beyond the training space. So I did this demo, and I think you know about it, in my 2004 book, The Algebraic Mind. Um, sorry, 2001 book, Algebraic Mind, um, in which uh, there was an identity function. So we trained a neural network to represent identity on a subset of even numbers. And if you test it on another set of even numbers, not in the training set, it appears as if it has learned the function of identity. But then you go to odd numbers, which have a bit that the network hasn't seen before, and people say that's not fair to the network, but a person can do this. That's what my uh, 99 science paper with the babies was all about. The babies can do this kind of thing. Babies can generalize outside the space of examples, but the network can't. You give it the even numbers, and it can't go to odd numbers. You might actually get that particular problem with convolution, incidentally. But in general, there's a set of problems where what we know is something deeply abstract, and you can fake it for a while by having a lot of examples. But you move outside that space of examples, and it doesn't work anymore. These problems are fundamentally different. The point of the algebraic mind is these problems, I took a quote, um, took a quote that says, thought is like a kind of algebra, which I think William James attributed to Barclay. Um, 
there's an algebra to how we think about, for example, language. So we know things for noun phrases and verb phrases, and we can substitute things in arbitrarily. Common sense, we know that any kind of container, if I put a spider in and I seal it and there's no hole, I can shake the container up. Thank you, Ernie Davis, for the example. Um, uh, Ernie and I have collaborated some, some work on common sense. I'm, I'm stealing from one of his examples. Um, you, shake, you shake the thing, it could, it could be you know, circle shaped, it could be elephant shaped, it doesn't matter. I don't need to do forward um, simulation like Josh Tenenbaum would do where I need to know where every particle of the, the vase is. I, I, I know what a bottle is and I can make inferences over this broad class. So far, anyway, the kinds of architectures that have worked great for perception just have not been able to get the job done. I think you kind of agree with this um, for reasoning, for language, for planning, and so forth. There's a weakness there. I think it's a principled weakness. And I think the inductive argument, even if I agreed that it was run properly, wouldn't really apply here. It's a different set of problems, which is why 60 years, no progress. 60 years, no progress in common sense. No progress, to my mind, in open-ended conversational interface. 10, 000, or 10 million times more um, computation than we have before, and still no progress there. It's because it's a principally different problem. So the inductive argument does not apply. And probably I'm out of my eight minutes, and so I'll just leave it like that. Thank you very much. So I'm not, going, I'm not going to disagree on the, on the facts, but sort of more on the, uh, uh, on, on the, 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 the course that we should, we should employ to, to proceed. So it is clear, so we agree on the fact that uh, uh, we don't have the underlying paradigms that, that would allow us to get machines to learn common sense. That was kind of the main uh, theme of, uh, of my talk. We certainly agree on this. But we, we do have a new paradigm today that only popped up in the last few years or became practical in the last few years um, around deep learning that at least gives us a chance to have a shot at it. And people really haven't tried very hard yet. This is a lot of things that my personal research is on for the little time I have left to do, actually do research myself um, or with my students at NYU. Uh, is about uh, basically you know, unsupervised, uh, learning unsupervised models of, of the world by observation with the hope that eventually when we figure out how to do this properly, uh, we'll, um, we'll, we'll have machines that have at least some notion of intuitive physics, if not common sense. The one thing that you said during your talk, which I agree to, which was a quote from uh, Eros Simoncelli, who is somewhere here, um, here he is, uh, that uh, the, the, the problem with uh, learning intuitive physics and, and predictive models of the world is that the world is intrinsically unpredictable. Uh, uh, you know, either because it's actually stochastic uh, because of quantum mechanics or just because it's an observ not fully observable uh, and, uh, and, and for that reason not predictable. So if I put this pen, this is your pen by the way. Um, here I am wanting to take note knowing thanks. it's there wondering how right. to get th th of mind. Th thanks for leaving it here because you know, I'm going to use it as a prop. So if I put this pen on the table, I use this example all the time, and I tell you I, I'm going to let go of my finger, you can tell the pen is going to fall. You probably can't tell in which direction it's going to fall. And every time I do the experiment, it's going to fall in a different direction. So if I, if I use a traditional supervised learning technique to train a system where the input to the system is, uh, here is the position of the pen, and the output that the system should predict is, uh, what is going to be the position of the pen after I, I lift my finger, uh, the, the, there's no way the system can make an accurate prediction. It cannot, it cannot work if it has to make a single prediction of where the pen is going to fall because it's essentially unpredictable. Um, but it can predict that, the, that the, the pen is going to fall. So uh, if you are uh, mathematically inclined, you say, oh, well, what you, want to, what you want the machine to model is not just a single prediction, but a distribution, a probability distribution over possible outcomes. And as Eero said, uh, it's very difficult to model probability distributions of the real world because it's too complicated. And so what we've been trying to do is figure out alternative ways of representing uh, multiple outcomes for, uh, for, for a, a predictive system and still be able to train it to, to uh, predict the, the future to some extent or fill in the blanks in the presence of a certainty. So that's where the technical questions are and where uh, Gary perhaps sees a failure of the last 60 years, I see an opportunity that only appeared in the last few years of actually being able to attack this problem. First of all, being able to formulate it and second to actually being able to attack it. So yes, there's been you know, very, very little progress in, uh, 
uh, the acquisition of common sense by machine over the last 60 years. But there is a new set of techniques that I think you know, are, are giving us a chance. Now, uh, back to the original uh, topic of the discussion, I think, um, uh, again, in my talk, I said that we do need more structure. We certainly need, need structure for, um, we seem to have, as humans, the ability to kind of reconfigure or, or prediction engine, if you want, uh, to any new situation that we encounter. So we don't have a little predictor for every situation we've ever faced. We, have, we seem to have some sort of reconfigurable, reconfigurable uh, prediction engine that we seem to fit to the situation at hand. Um, and things become, it's, it's when we do things very often that they become subconscious and may, maybe some specialized hardware is, uh, is, is devoted to it or is trained to, uh, to do the task. But at least when we do a task for the first time, we kind of very uh, consciously uh, do this task. Well, we don't know how to do this, but there's probably a lot of structure we have to build for this to be possible. Um, and I, I say again, uh, almost all the papers you see at NIPS uh, or you know, any machine learning conference or computer vision conference or, neural, uh, or uh, natural language understanding conference is about architecture and uh, uh, innate machinery or prior knowledge, if you want, or structure. That's, that's what a lot of people work on. So nobody in the business is going to deny this. Um, this is really what's going on. Uh, but in addition to this, I think we, we are missing basic principles for, uh, for unsupervised learning. You guys can uh, both stand. We also have microphones. Oh, there's a bunch of microphones. So do you guys have, yeah. you guys want to want to follow up on anything? Sure. Yeah. Is it on? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. A couple of people are leaving. We'll wait a, we'll sec, wait a second for them to leave. Once those people are out of the room, I'm going to concede a point. Sure you want to go? Right, so the point I'm going to concede uh, to Jan is Jan is optimistic about doing unsupervised learning. He's made the point that he can only really do it now. There was no computational infrastructure, essentially, to do unsupervised learning from video before. I think that that's right, and I think that gives some reason to pursue that research program. Um, I still wouldn't do it the way that Jan does it, but I, th I think that that's a fair point. Um, we're much better positioned to explore it. Now, on the point of architecture at NIPS, it's sort of right, and it goes back to the last slide that I have. The architecture at NIPS, yes, 90% of the papers have fiddling around with architecture. I should say it in a nicer way. Um, <laughs> I'll come back to that later. Um, but it's mostly kind of using the same Lego blocks over and over again. Um, and there's certainly some innovations there, but it's mostly kind of in the same space of, of Lego blocks, and it's a particular vocabulary. It's a vocabulary. I noticed when you had your questions for AI um, before, they're all like about gradients and stuff like that. So like there's a big question in the field of how you don't have an exploding gra gradient or a vanishing gradient. We can talk later about what that is. But so there's a vocabulary like that. And there's another vocabulary like translational invariance, the cognitive scientist thinking. And at the very least, I would think it's worth looking at whether there's anything there. So what you did in this great paper that I keep uh, saluting is you took translational var invariance. I don't know the history about why you did it, but you took something that is certainly recognizable in the vocabulary of cognitive science, instantly recognizable to any vision scientist, um, and translated that into the language of what you do when you have gradients. Um, that's what I would like to see and don't see at NIPS. Well, I mean, the history of this is, you know, Kubel and Weasel, 1962, and Fukushima, 1982. So that's uh, a very clear. Well, they were uh, certainly thinking about translation of variance. They certainly, I mean, they did. Um, you know, the idea that you have neurons that look at local receptive fields and are basically, uh, uh, you have a version of that neuron everywhere in the visual field, uh, that's the idea of translation invariance and, and convolutions. But people in signal processing also gave, came up with the idea of convolutions independently of. Uh, uh, of, of biology just because, you know, if you do any kind of local processing and you, you do the same, the statistics of images is, is translation invariant. So 
if, if there is an advantage in detecting a particular feature in a particular location in the image, it's probably a good idea to detect it in another place in the image, and you can make this argument. And there are sort of more mathematical arguments behind this as well that, you know, uh, Aero has been making and, you know, Stefan Mala and various other people like that. So th sure, there are sort of, all, you know. Can I interrupt just once? Uh, all Liz Belke is saying is to do the same thing for um, object persistence over time, to say that we have conservation of mass or something like that, and that, you know, if an object is over here, it's probably going to be at another place nearby over time. And, like, it's qualitatively the same. It's more complicated to implement. But why aren't we trying to do things like build that in as a prior? Right. So let me, let me tell you a story about this. Uh, the, the first time I started playing, the first few times I started playing with those, uh, with those networks, and I started publishing about them, the first question I had from people who had some experience in image processing and computer vision was, why don't you, why do you learn the low-level features uh, in, in your networks? Because we know what they, what they have to be. You know, if, uh, if we look at biology, it's oriented edge detectors that we see in the primary, primary visual cortex area. You could build that in. You don't need to learn it. And my response was, I don't need to build it in. I can run it. <laughs> and that and, goes. And it's the same, it's exactly the same algorithm that is used for learning every layer. So I don't need to do anything special for those things to emerge. And they emerge naturally, whatever the task today with modern convolutional nets, regardless of the tasks that you train those convolutional nets to do, uh, if you train them with natural images, you will see oriented edge detectors appear because it's really intrinsic to the data. It's really more a reflection of the nature of images than the task you're trying to solve. So I was going to say, and that goes to aesthetics. The one slide that I most regret not having had up, I had many slides, obviously, um, and I had to kill many. Um, the one that I most regret killing was, was one of Maxwell's equations. And the joke I was going to make is that physicists want to have all of physics reduced to four equations on a t-shirt. And I have this feeling that many people in machine learning are questing for something else. The title of the slide was Physics Envy. So I understand the aesthetic that says, wouldn't it be cool if we could get everything with these four principles? But at the same time, I see this huge failure, and you, you have a nice asterisk on it, but this huge failure over 60 years to make progress on a different set of problems. And so like, I think a reasonable interpretation of the literature would be these techniques are the bomb for doing perception. So, but they're not so good for the other stuff, so maybe we need another equation or two. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's where you would actually say we'd need another other unsupervised learning algorithm, and I'm saying let's borrow a little bit more generously from cognitive science. Right, so I, I, don't, I don't think it, it's fair to say there's been you know, uh, continuous efforts by many people over 60 years to kind of to do this. The ability to uh, train system end-to-end, -end, you know, you have to kind of walk be before you can run, and so just the ability to be able to recognize images uh, through machine learning at a reasonable uh, performance only popped up in the last four years. And so there was no point in trying to kind of attack this problem before because, uh, y you know, who would have believed any effort uh, uh, towards that direction? Nobody was actually working on it. And so it's only in the last four years that the question of going beyond supervised learning and perception has popped up. It's very, very recent. And it's only in the last two years that people, uh, in the case of, you know, in people at DeepMind, it's even more recent, uh, that people have thought about unsupervised learning as something that's really uh, important for, uh, um, you know, interactive learning of uh, robots and things of that type. So it's very recent. It's not 60 years. We're talking two years maximum. And on the, sorry, just to clarify, okay, on, maybe on, on, yeah. on, on you know, learning, unsupervised learning for learning forward models, for example, for the, the purpose of learning tasks, you know, robot learning and things like this. Um, there is a conference called the Conference on Robot Learning. The, this conference has not taken place yet. The first instance of this conference is going to take place in November. That tells you something, right? It tells you that the idea of using learning for robots is very new. No, nobody has really seriously thought about this for a while. I think now, now is maybe a good time to open it up to the uh, audience. So why don't we start with Ned here? So, this is a question for y for Yan. Um, so, you're against one kind of inbuilt structure, and for another kind of inbuilt structure. The kind you're against is the one that you evoked with the remark about we do better when we fire more linguists. Um, the kind you're for came out in uh, the fact that if you stick um, um, a, a unit in for low-level features, one middle-level features, high-level features, so more sort of separation of, of modules is good. Uh, convolution is good. 
So, but what I'm not getting is what's the difference between the kind of inbuilt structure you're for and the kind of inbuilt structure you're against? Can you clarify that? Okay, I don't have any a priori for the kind that's good and the kind that's bad, uh, but my attitude to this is Occam's razor. So I'd like to find the minimum amount of structure that will still get the machine to do what I want. And the reason I want, the reason I came up with this sort of uh, uh, heuristic uh, uh, strategy is because the more structure you put in, the more chances of that you have that the structure would be wrong that you have an underlying assumption about destruction that it will turn out to be wrong. So for example, um, the way uh, a, for example, a handwriting recognition system uh, uh, used to work before we used neural nets was by essentially analyzing the, the shape using uh, you know, algorithms that, that, that could be you know, designed by, by hand, uh, measuring things like you know, uh, how many pixels are, are, are black proportionally to the, you know, within a bounding box and and measuring the ratio of the perimeter to the area, and then you know, computing Fourier coefficients of the image, and you know, all kinds of things like this that we thought were relevant. Um, and um, every time you, you, you compute one of those things, you make some assumption about, uh, uh, about, about the nature of the character. So a lot of those features get destroyed when you add a little noise, or when you have characters that touch, and you can separate them. And so you want to minimize the amount of uh, prior knowledge you put in, because this prior knowledge limits the maximum performance of your system. So you want to apply Occam's razor. It's just Occam's razor, basically. Uh, have the minimal amount of moving parts in your model uh, so that it can be maximally flexible. Occam's razor doesn't help. Occam's razor doesn't help. Occam, you have to, there has to be some principal difference between the kind of structure you're against, inbuilt structure you're against, and the kind you're for, just to, because you're for some and, and against others. It can't just be a principle of minimizing inbuilt structure. No, it is. I mean, I wish I had uh, a magic uh, evaluation function that told me which kind of structure is good, which kind is bad, because then I could, you know, write all the ninety percent papers at NIPS that actually. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, nobody has that. Uh, Maybe it would be helpful, ingrained. at least for the purposes of this debate, to get clear between you on, you know, what kinds of inbuilt structure would count as vindicating one view rather than the other view. For example, my intuition is. If the only kind, relevant kinds of inbuilt structure are analogous to convolutional structure, that you know, cool geometric patterns of connectivity, which we use as the basis for our deep learning, then Jan wins and Gary loses. Whereas what Gary requires is something that's fairly different from that kind of thing in kind. You know, like if it was symbolic structure, that would be that would be ideal. Maybe something weaker than that would also count as you winning. But can you articulate the standard for you winning the debate? Uh, I mean, I don't know if I can fully do that, but I want to at least object to one piece of what you said. So um, I think that convolution is vindication for nativism, and I think that the critical question is actually mapping. So if you could map all of the things that Liz Belke and I, um, in our separate papers, have advocated, and Alan Leslie and so forth, uh, on causality, ha have advocated, and show that they map onto the gadgets that you needed to add to the neural networks to make them work, I would take that as vindication. If it turned out that you couldn't find any mapping between the stuff that we talked about and what was there, I wouldn't. So if, if you look empirically at the array of gadgets that people have thrown, some of them have nothing to do with the kind of stuff that Liz and I have advocated. So there is a really important recent discovery, recent like four years or whatever, called the ReLU, um, Rectified Linear Unit, which is a new activity function for translating what happens in a neural network unit. It has nothing to do with anything that I would have predicted. It's cool, it makes things computationally faster on GPUs, but that really properly belongs in the toolkit of, of messing around with the linear algebra in an implementational context. But if somebody had said in advance of discussion, and in fact, people in Wiesel said, and probably some other people, um, Germans in, in the um, late 1800s, had said that you need innately to have translational invariance, and then Jan walks along and finds a really elegant way of putting it in a neural network, that is not a victory for less nativism if you have to build it into the model and it maps perfectly onto the things the nativists are saying. So I think mapping is really the key criteria. And then you could look at the list and say, do we need half of them or a quarter of them or whatever? How many of those things map onto what we actually need? So on your long list of things that you, you might hypothesize are necessary as prior structure, I would agree maybe on two of them out of the list of how many, 12? 
You want me to put it back up, or, or I mean, which which two? We can. I'll deduce the rest. Uh, well, maybe translation invariant, and even that, I'm not. That actually, one you you built. I'm not in. actually. You can't, you can't walk sure. that one back now. Come on. I can actually. <laughs> I can. So, in the sense that uh, there is no such thing in the, the the human visual system, right? It's not like we have the equivalent of weight sharing in the in the in the visual context. Well, there's an interesting question about the fovea, for example. Versus yeah. No, I mean the the the, the translation invariance trick in conventional nets is a way of reducing the uh, amount of uh, training samples they need to do in supervised learning. If we were to use unsupervised learning, we wouldn't need to actually hardwire translation invariance. We would still hardwire local connections. But not not translation invariance, and in fact, the visual the visual system is not translation invariance because we don't have a constant density of uh, of uh, uh, you know, right, photoreceptors in the retina. Of the visual system. Yeah, so it I think it emerges naturally because uh, images are are you know naturally have translation invariant uh, statistics. And if we use unsupervised running, we wouldn't need to uh, hardwire weight sharing. So okay. that would disappear. Okay, great. So back to, to David's question. If it turns out that it, to make your unsupervised learning algorithm work, you actually have to have something that maps onto representing objects, sets, places, um, spatiotemporal continuity, et cetera, then I win. If it turns out yeah. that your math doesn't have anything to do with those things and it's just stuff like ReLUs to make, make it all go, then I'm wrong. Uh, absolutely, I totally agree with this. So, wow, yeah. somebody get that on recording. So the uh, no, I mean absolutely. In fact, and if there is no way, uh, so we really do have a debate here. If, if there is no way to do unsupervised learning without putting all those things you talk about, uh, I wouldn't be the one to to find it because I don't want to build those things in. Just say so, it turns out you have to build in some spatial properties, like say convolutional structure. Possibly, if you have to, then you think Gary wins. No. Yeah. Uh, there's a way these debates get kind of boring pretty quickly, which is everyone accepts some. You need some innate structure. Yeah, some innate structure. Yeah, I mean, a little we bit of innate structure. We have a real difference win. here. I don't think it's boring. You know, yeah. But let me ask Jan one question, then we can go let's, back to the let's, audience. Sorry, let's, let's move now to Barbara. So right. you began with babies and presumed certain things about babies and what they come into the world with. Why not begin even earlier? Because evolution is some sort of selection, and can we learn lessons from that? Was this for Jana or for me, or we just want it, to both of you? You both began with babies. I mean, evolution is learning; it's just on a different it, time scale. So and, and are there lessons to be learned from that? Well, sure. I mean, so uh, so the question is, uh, you know, for for the purpose of uh, survival of individual species, uh, I think evolution probably arrived at different. Uh, uh, trade-offs of, of innate machinery versus, uh, you know, flexibility afforded by learning. And so, you know, uh, uh, humans seems to be kind of on the, on the far scale in the animal kingdom of adaptability, and that what allows us to, you know, all species to survive in all kinds of environments are extremely diverse, much more diverse than most animal species. That's just adaptability. So I think there is an uh, evolutionary advantage to having a very powerful learning engine, if you want. Um, and the ability to build predictive models of the world, you know, to plan complex sequences of actions, to predict the outcome of a, you know, a sequence of, uh, uh, you know, complicated uh, actions. That's what, that's what really, that, that's why I said, you know, prediction is the essence of intelligence. But, um, uh, but animals have this to some extent, and uh, um, to a large extent, as a matter of fact, and that would be, Happy if, you know, uh, at the end of my career, we had a machine that was as smart as a cat or even a rat in that respect. Had enough, you know, as much common sense as a cat. I have two things, an answer to you and an answer to something Jan said. So first of all, there is a sense of learning that is so um, neutered of all of its power that it encompasses evolution. I'm not happy with that sense of learning. So um, I agree. You know, you well, you just said it, but yeah. I mean, so you said evolution is is just learning at a different time scale. There's a certain sense in which that's true, but it's a certain sense in which it just undermines the whole debate, and there's nothing to talk about if you encompass both. You you really want to know, in the case of biology, what what evolved in, and, and then what do you learn? And it could be different in different species. Some things might be innate for some species, learned for some species. If you just have this kind of X learning that's broad and encompassing, then you can't have the conversation anymore. So that's the first. Thing I'd say. The second thing is there is a field of evolutionary genetic neural networks. Um, it hasn't succeeded so far, I think, in either of our views. Um, there's been some interesting papers. There was one from OpenAI earlier 
this year. Um, it hasn't gotten that far, but I think it's deeply interesting. I think the reason it hasn't gotten far is people are trying to do too much in the course of like one dissertation. So you have a graduate student who tries in the four years, you, historically with much less power than we have now, to get something to evolve something pretty complicated. And evolution is a slow process. It took you know a billion years to get here, and you know you could evolve the stuff that a worm does and think that you're on the wrong path because it's not very impressive. And people haven't pursued the path far enough. What is true of a human is that in something like a hundred thousand years, we evolved language, right? I mean, it was a relatively quick transformation from a previous. Um, ancestor, but that ancestor had a whole lot of evolution that already happened, right? Primate brains are really sophisticated. You can think of their genomes as this big library of subroutines, and there was some, you know, jiggling of the box and recombination of those subroutines and representational formats and whatever to build something new and exciting. But there was a lot of stuff already there. And so if you your primitives in doing the evolution is like, I can sort of move this one connection weight in that one, it's probably not capturing the hierarchy of genetic processes where you can have a gene like PAC6 that controls thousands of other genes and cascades. We don't have that yet in the evolutionary stuff. But it'll happen eventually. But, but there is, there is uh, quite a bit of work now. I, I think the, the limit of the, the limitations of the, the, the power of this idea of using evolutionary algorithms uh, to evolve the structure of network uh, is just a limitation in uh, uh, compute power. Um, so you know, companies like, like Facebook and Google have infrastructures with you know, many thousands of GPUs, which are the cards that we use to do the computation. And even that is not enough to kind of simulate ev uh, evolution at kind of the neural net level. So we need graduate students for this. So, you know, the learning algorithm that's used to train uh, neural nets is called SGD, Stochastic Gradient Descent. And there is another algorithm called GSD, which means graduate student descent. And that's the... <laughs> and that, you know, that consists in sort of, you know, asking graduate students to come up with sort of new structures for neural nets. Okay, uh, next question from Rob Long. Hi, uh, so just trying to keep getting clear on the disagreement. Gary, can you say more about uh, what a mapping is? Uh, maybe give, mapping? Yeah, maybe give an example. I mean it in a sense, I guess, originally comes from math, um, that you can understand process A in terms of process B, and you can completely um, relate the things in A to the ones in B. So translational invariance can be mapped onto convolution. convolution is just a realization. So translation is an abstract algorithm. There are a number of ways to do it, and I think any reasonable person would say this is a form of translation invariance. We could have a sidebar about whether humans are actually translation invariant or whether they approximate it, but just look at the algorithm and the components. Like you could talk about translation invariance is this thing and this thing are identical. Well, here's the mechanism within convolution to make sure that they're treated the same way by having weights that implement that. So it, I mean, it's, it's basically saying there's like a parallel identity. I can understand this in those terms. So I can map this stuff that I know about chemistry onto this stuff um, that I know about physics. I certainly didn't invent the notion. Okay, uh, question over there. There's two, uh, the woman in, uh, no, behind you. Hi, um, so I know the example that you both have been referencing is language uh, with dialogue systems. Um, and um, with uh, self-driving cars, and also um, you've also been talking about um, babies and like facial recognition, face tracking. Um, these are all very social kinds of problems, right? So, so I mean, right now, I mean, multi-agent RL is something that we has been working on. We've been working on um, that's been slowly growing. Um, same same thing with people interested in safety with. Um, the kind of thinking about like inverse RL and, and these kinds of motivations. Um, so I'm kind of trying to understand how much do you think the the social aspects of being able to work with with people is going to be a a, a strong um, part in this component of, of growing, or do we need, or are we able to just be relatively agnostic about our understanding of our even our own selves? So I mean, certainly. Um there's something called inverse RL, which you meant, inverse reinforcement learning, or, uh, which is a particular way of doing what's called imitation learning. So training an intelligent agent by imitation with a, a teacher, essentially. So it's not supervised learning in the sense that the teacher doesn't give the agent the exact answer, but it's, um, I know you know the answer, but I think for everybody else. Um, but, uh, but it's uh, learning by demonstration. So you observe someone doing something and you infer what 
underlying objective function the, the, the teacher uses to, uh, to do the task. Um, so uh, this is obviously a very powerful way of training a machine, or this would be a powerful way of training a machine if we knew how to do it properly. Uh, and there's quite, quite a bit of work on this in the context of robotics uh, on, uh, on imitation learning. Uh, but we can't claim, you know, like in supervised learning, we can't claim that we have uh, principles that really kind of work to the extent that we can observe this in animals and humans. Um, you know, would things like mirror neurons, for example, spontaneously appear, or do we have to hardwire it? That's a good question for, you know, whether innate uh, machinery is, is required there. Um, so I think there's probably, a, um, that's probably one domain where I would concede there's probably a need for some sort of innate machinery to sort of, uh, enable uh, imitation running. Take some front there. I think Gary said what works for perception won't work for cognition. Uh, what's, is perception a really special entity that's an easy target? And what, what, are, what, what do you mean by cognition? I mean, I was a little bit sloppy about that. What I think really is the case is there are a set of problems you can do that are pattern recognition problems where fundamentally what you need to do is classify things. And these algorithms are very good at that. Um, there are lots of other things you need to do in cognition. I, the line between perception and cognition is actually gray. So I would say that when I interpret a scene as a whole, I'm putting some cognition in, maybe things that I know about people and rooms and, and physics and, and all these kinds of stuff. At some point, you go from, I'm just recognizing entities that are sort of like stored examples I've seen before to I'm reasoning about them. Roughly speaking, when I'm talking about cognition, it's reasoning, it's language, and so forth. And these are the domains where I think we've made less progress as a field. Um, so my question is, uh, I guess one source of innate information is like the sensory modalities we have and other ways that we can interact and sense the world. Um, do you think it's plausible, do either of you think it's plausible that we just are not, like we, the, it's a hardware problem to a certain extent, like we're not collecting the right data with the right types of hardware, and that once we have, um, say, like robots that have very exquisite senses of touch and much better motor control and so forth, that some of this difficulty will go away? So I don't think so. I mean, certainly hardware should make, you know, will make progress. Robotic hardware sensors will make progress. But sensors are already very good. And we have sensors that we can put on robots and cars that are far superior to uh, uh, the, the basic sensors that we have uh, in our eyes. For example, uh, the, you know, Google's autonomous cars use uh, LiDAR. Uh, this is an active sensing system that basically gives you a depth map of uh, sort of a distance for every pixel in an image. Uh, you can do this with, we can do this with our eyes, with stereo vision, but it only works up to about 10 meters. You know, uh, beyond that, uh, we can't use stereo to really estimate uh, distance. So, uh, I mean, certainly we can use things like, uh, if you have a car that has uh, a, a camera, but also has a LiDAR, then you can use the LiDAR uh, to get, you know, reliable depth estimate, and then use that to teach the, system, the vision system from the camera to estimate depth without need for the LIDAR. And there's you know, a lot of experiments this. In fact, um, I worked on a project like this about 10 years ago uh, where uh, uh, we used kind of a hardwired innate machinery uh, for stereo vision to estimate depth. And then we used this to train a conventional net to estimate depth from a single image. And we could use this to drive a robot in, in you know, off-road in nature. Um, so, yeah, this kind of stuff, you know, uh, touch and, you know, all kinds of other sens sensory modality, uh, uh, you know, increase the, the different views that you have of the world and sort of allow you to make better, uh, build better models of the world, definitely. One, one sentence on that. I think faster hardware is good for the scientist to evaluate models faster, but I don't think that my brain is so much better than a whole, um, in terms of sheer computational power, than a whole huge cluster of, Facebook uh, GPUs and, and computers and so forth. I, I think mm -hmm. whatever is the software in my brain or firmware or whatever could probably be run on today's hardware. Maybe it'd be a little slower or something like that. I don't think it's a principal problem. It's that we don't know what, what to get the hardware to do. But still, it's good to have it faster so we can test things. So I completely disagree with this. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think the, the, the raw compute power of the human brain is actually gigantic. 
Um, so, so I have more compute power than Facebook. That's great. Oh, you do. You definitely do. Even you. Um, <laughs> sorry, you were asking for it. Um, and what about you, Jan? <laughs> um, oh, He's part of Facebook, therefore he has less. I, I'm going to let you skip that. Only question. thing I can tell you is that uh, uh, I'm the dumbest guy at Facebook Air Research. Um, I only hire people who are smarter than me. So, um, you, you know, we have 10 to the 14 synapses, roughly. Uh, they can change state about a thousand times a second. Maybe 1% of our brain is active at any one time. I mean, roughly you can say the brain does, you know, if you kind of don't care about a factor of 100 or so, you know, roughly 10 to the 18 to 10 to the 20 operations per second. Uh, we don't have GPUs that can go that far. Uh, the, the fastest GPU cards that we have can do 10 to the 13 operations per second. We're off by a factor of uh, at least 100,000. Um, and we are off by another factor of 100 in terms of power consumption. So the brain consumes about power 25 watts. Power consumption, I obviously agree. Yeah, and you know, a GPU card is 250 watts. A single, a single GPU card, 10 to the 13 operations per second. But look, there's two things. One is we have no idea what the right measurement is for a person. That's true. Um, and two is already, even if you sort of stipulate to the facts as Jan just suggested them, it's still, you can see there's a software problem in as much as like whatever that measly amount of computational power is that Facebook has, for some things it's way better than people like playing Go, right? So it really does depend on what algorithm you're trying to perform. Well, the image recognition system that uh, Facebook runs, uh, it actually runs four image recognition system on every image that is being uploaded on Facebook. Uh, this is run 1.5 billion times per day. Right, and a person couldn't do that, right? Of course. I really want to ask Jan a last question. We're running out of time. May, may I? Um, let's take one or two more, and then we'll, then we'll uh, get yours. <laughs> uh, over there on the yellow. Uh, okay, so my question would be to Jan. So, you know, uh, back to the uh, argument about how adding more structure to language has been failing. And, uh, you know, you made the example about how someone asked you at some point, why not bake in like some feature, you know, detection and your answer for vision and your answer was because we can't do it. Uh, so, initial language understanding is specifically throughout the past, you know, few years nothing as revolutionary as object detection, you know, success has happened. And it, you know, we are doing much, much better for like extra, many more, you know, going back to what Gary was saying, pattern recognition kind of tasks, so we can do better Q&A as long as the answer is explicitly in say a given, you know, piece of text. Uh, but like for going beyond what we can see and like overfitting to the very particular test set that we are creating, we, we don't see much happening. And so my question to you is, what do you think we can do to go beyond that if not build on up, you know, build on top of the kind of knowledge we already have about language structure, about like maybe common sense knowledge? So how far do you think we can go by just, you know, inventing new architectures and doing end-to-end -end tasks if we want to do actual natural language understanding as opposed to, you know, building models that are just overfitting to intricacies of the data sets? Right. So th there is actually you know, a significant portion of the work done at, at uh, Facebook Air Research is on language understanding and dialogue systems and translation, things of this type. I would, I don't entirely agree with your premise that there is, you know, although there's been a revolution in image recognition and speech recognition due to deep learning, that there has not been a similar revolution in natural language understanding. There has. So but, what is your example? So an example, example is translation. So until about two years ago or sure. yeah. last so year. Yeah, so I think that's, com you know, kind of, <laughs> Controversial, right? I mean, machine translation is not necessarily language understanding, but it's a mapping, right? You go from a left to right, there's a direct mapping, so you don't necessarily reason beyond what's explicit. So right. I count that as more in the you know, domain of. Um, yeah, but you have passing. to kind of be quantitative about it. So, sure. you know, the same way speech recognition error rates have gone down by, you know, a factor of two within a year or two when people started using deep learning and then has gone down by another factor of uh, two or three after that. For image recognition, is you know there is kind of a, a step function where you know went down by a factor of two around 2013, and then it sort of kept uh, coming down. So it went, you know, in 2012 it was um, uh, or 2011 the error rate on ImageNet was 26 percent, and then you know as soon as people started using convolutional net, it was about 15 percent, and now it's uh, less than four percent. Human performance is about five. So you know there's huge progress due to the fact that 
those things work. We have better hardware to run it, better software, better, and more people working on it, and so more exploration of the parameter space and more ideas about architectures, in fact. Now, the same thing is happening for, neural, for uh, natural language understanding, and it's been happening for the last few years, where, uh, uh, you know, about two, about three years ago, there were the first experiments that showed that for things like uh, question answering, translation, and various other tasks, sort of end-to-end -end tasks in uh, natural language understanding, like intent classification, for example, um, things would work a lot better, if, you know, by using uh, uh, deep neural nets. Uh, for, for translation, it was really, really a big, uh, a bi you know, a big progress. It took about three years, or about two years, for people to sort of turn this into a sort of operational translation system that actually works at scale and can be used every day. But now, uh, all the translation system you see by uh, uh, by Google, Microsoft, and Facebook use neural nets, and so that's okay. a big progress. They work a lot better than the previous systems that were also machine learning based, but more kind of superficial in terms of their understanding of the text. There's I, I very, would... very, very little hardwired linguistic language about this uh, in those systems. Okay, Gary, I... now you can you can either respond to this or you can ask your question. Okay, well, then if I have to choose, then I'll ask my question, which is this. Why do you think that unsupervised, or let me back up a sense, we both agree that reinforcement learning from pixels is not getting us anywhere. Um, it's, in my view, it's not abstract enough. You might have your own take on it. Um, but we both think that it's vulnerable to a lot of problems. Why do you think that unsupervised learning is going to evade those problems? To me, they seem like, at some level, trying to do the same thing, which is trying to abstract too much of a very complicated world without enough initial structure. So why, what's the difference between the two in your view? So I refer to the, the cake analogy uh, that I had in one of the slides. It, by the way, it's become a bit of a meme in the machine learning literature now, uh, <laughs> community. Um, the, the fact that the bulk of what we learn is, um, is, is models of the world that are not particularly linked to uh, a set of tasks. Uh, so. Ultimately, the, the system, that we, the autonomous AI systems we're going to build are going to use reinforcement learning, but it's going to be model-based reinforcement learning. And so what, what's happened in the history of, uh, uh, of machine learning is that there were people working on model-based reinforcement learning in the 80s and 90s and got some really good success. Jerry Tesoro, for example, had a reinforcement learning-based system that trained a neural net to play backgammon, and he beat the world champion with it. Um, and then the same phenomenon that occurred with uh, neural nets for perception occurred in reinforcement learning, where in the mid 90s, uh, people you know, had some uh, theoretical results that showed that model based reinforcement learning had problems with convergence. And they started only focusing on much more, much more simple models, model free reinforcement learning, which you can analyze theoretically um, and sort of abandon the ambition of using reinforcement learning to build intelligent machines. Huge mistake. This, which was a mistake. So same mistake occurred with neural nets, where people abandoned the idea of using neural nets and kind of reverted to using much simpler uh, learning algorithms in the mid-90s. And it's only in the last five years or so that uh, you know, neural nets have uh, come back to the fore, and model-based reinforcement learning is only in the last year or so. People really weren't working on, uh, so people, as you said, at DeepMind are very enamored with uh, model-free RL, and they're starting to get interested in model-based RL as well as we are at Facebook and various other, other places at Berkeley. There's a very good group at Berkeley working on model-based RL at University of Washington as well. It's not very well understood theoretically. There's a lot of work to do. It doesn't really work yet. And this is why we don't have uh, you know, cat robots um, that are as agile as a cat. This is why we don't have robots that can kind of grab um, you know, manipulate objects the, the, the way animals and humans can do it. Um, do, you know, we, we don't have this ability to, with machines to build models of the world. That's what's missing. That's, in, my, in my view, that's what's missing. And a little innate structure might help you get a long way towards that. A minimal amount of it, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, no, we have, we have, we have, we have, we've got some, we got some oh, more time. Um, Chris, go time. had a question? All right. Oh, yeah, I do actually. Um, thanks. This is a question for Jan. Um, you said that common sense is the ability to fill in the blanks. Um, Another way of looking at some of the cases you discussed is that there's a general ability to employ inference to the best explanation. And that might actually have the status of a fundamental innate principle here. If that is the, be if that is the correct account of the examples, then it would have consequences elsewhere. I wonder if you could just say something more generally about how you regard inference to the best explanation in relation to your general program. So inference and, and producing explanations, you mean? So inference, inference to, the best, to, the best to the best explanation. Abduction. Abduction, yeah. Oh. Um. 
Yeah, so I, I, I think inference is sort of a, uh, or inference or reasoning, I guess, would be sort of an orthogonal direction uh, with uh, uh, unsupervised learning. So I think um, there are several types of reasoning, right? There's a type of reasoning you do when you're face, faced with sort of a situation in the world and you are kind of uh, trying to figure out what to do to reach, to make the world reach a particular uh, end state. And there is certainly reasoning there that involves not simple manipulation, but you know, intuitive physics simulation of some kind. And sometimes that involves kind of discrete events and, and perhaps that we interpret as symbols because we like to use language to express them. Uh, but and orangutans, doesn't do, orangutans don't do this, right? They don't have language. They are actually not even social animals. So, and they can do all that stuff, right? They can make knots. They can make, you know, they can use tools. I'm not sure I answered your question. Though. Well, it seems to be a more general phenomenon. So when you see the half face and you conclude there's a occlusion, of, um, the best explanation, that's the real face because there are not many half faces around elsewhere. Um, yeah. So that's, that's a much more general explanation of some of these phenomena. Um, so that, that's a possible candidate for something that someone might put forward as something right. innate that's used throughout all of these cases. Well, I mean, the, the, the problem is how do you discover, how do you, get the, you know, how do you get the machine or a brain to learn the structure of the world in such a way that it will produce those most likely explanations? And that's, that's what I'm after. My take on this is that inference, the best explanation is super important. Totally understudied, though there is certainly work on it in AI. Um, and you can't do it unless you have a simple manipulating apparatus. That was, at some level, the point of my yeah. book, The Algebraic Mind. I, I don't do, think I everything that, that looks... Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I don't think everything that looks like inference the best explanation actually is. So I think that some of the things that Jan does could be conceived of as inference the best explanation and aren't really. They're, they're just... There are cases and cases, but there are some cases like that that I think certainly like scientists do, for example, and we don't have AI tools that can do it. Yeah, I mean, we reduce, uh, very often we reduce uh, this kind of inference to um, simple mathematical principles like energy minimization, right? So we have some model that tells us whether an interpretation or a solution is consistent by basically measuring, you know, computing some sort of uh, score of whether you know, is the left side of my uh, face compatible with the right side of my face? Uh, things like that. And uh, inference is basically finding the configuration of least, uh, of least energy. And that, that can sort of um, encompass a lot of what we think of as, uh, as reasoning and finding of best explanation. Let's see if we can fit in one or two um, just uh, quickly now. Uh, right there. Um, hi, yes, this question is for both Jan and Gary. So Jan, you gave a definition of intelligence that was about prediction, and I think that works well on the perception side of things. Um, I actually favor a different definition of intelligence, which is novel problem solving, solving problems that by definition we don't know how to solve. And I think that's a little bit more on the cognition side and requires reasoning. And I guess my question is, do you see deep learning or neural nets um, ever being useful in reasoning tasks? I, I mean, Jan will have his own answer. I see them as being useful, but not being sufficient. So I think that there's all kinds of pattern recognition people do in problem solving, and deep learning is a good tool for pattern recognition. Then there's abstraction, and that doesn't seem like it's a good tool for that. So I think it's actually a good tool for abstraction, too. In fact, I think it's the essence of the su success, the fact that we have this kind of layered architecture that allows the system to uh, produce you know, abstract representation of the world, although they're relatively simple. And in terms of reasoning, I think uh, the idea of using the, 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 the main issue with sort of classical ways of building uh, uh, systems that are capable of reasoning is that they are based on symbols and logic. Right. And the problem is that that's incompatible with learning because learning likes continuous and differentiable stuff. Um, <laughs> and so if we want to implement reasoning uh, in, in intelligent systems that can learn, then we will have to replace symbols by vectors and we will have to replace logic by algebra. Okay, all all of those who learned logic in graduate school will realize that that claim was false. Go on. <laughs> Over there. Uh, hi. Um, I'm wondering, just through all of this, I mean, the obvious difference between artificial intelligence and uh, mm -hmm. native intelligence seems to be um, instinct, you know, primal instincts, emotion. I'm wondering how much... Um, has there only been any integration of hormonal pathways or uh, like more studies about like the structure of the amygdala involved in artificial intelligence? Because I feel like so much of reasoning is so grounded by 
our emotions. I mean, we're all here because we love um, this area of science. That's, I feel like that's a huge part of why, of our you know, everyday lives, I guess. How does that translate into machines? Yeah, so if you, if you look at the sort of basic design or the components that an autonomous intelligence system will have to have, uh, it has to have a, a, perhaps a, a model of the world if you want it to act intelligently so that it can sort of reason uh, before acting. It needs to have a way to generate a sequence of action, and it needs to have an objective function it wants to optimize. So, um, uh, and to be able to take a sequence of action uh, or predict the outcome of a sequence of action, it also has to have what's called a critic in the context of reinforcement learning, which is a module that predicts the uh, expected long-term value of the objective. So the objective measures if the machine is happy or unhappy in some abstract way. Right, it seems like and, something's missing from within. Right, and the, and the critic predicts uh, ahead of time if a particular action, for example, is going to bring a, a good act outcome or not. And you could think of this as a primitive form of emotion in the sense that, uh, you know, if the critic says, you know, something really bad is going to happen or is very likely that something bad is going to happen, it's kind of like fear, right? Avoiding this, this course of action is a bit like, behaves a bit like fear. Now, um, the, the, the question is like, you know, what about hormonal circuits in the brain? Why do we have this? You know, do we need this in robots and things like this? Um, actually, uh, I, you know, it's not entirely clear to me that it's required, but one thing that uh, I get asked all the time in, um, uh, you know, when I talk to the media about, about AI is that, you know, are, are robots going to take over and kill us all? You know, is there going to be a, you know, a Terminator type scenario? And, and this is a complete projection of uh, human character traits onto robots, and there's absolutely no reason why robots will want to dominate because they are intelligent. It's not because uh, an entity is intelligent that it wants to uh, dominate others or, 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 or take control. Um, and, uh, um, you know, we have perfect examples of people who are in position of power who are not particularly intelligent. I often use uh, that same example. Do you have the same president I do? <laughs> um, you know, I think the, the desire to uh, have power is more uh, correlated with testosterone than with intelligence, really. Gary, last word. I, I, I don't think I have one. Right. Very good. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. We will now adjourn to a reception over the, over the corridor. But thanks very much.